This video is the second in a series that's going to show the entire process of installing a pretty serious security gate system at our home. If you're interested, you can back up and watch me do the excavation and compaction and placing of the rebar that had to be done prior to building and setting the forms, anchor bolts, and conduits that will receive the concrete that will hold the whole thing together that you're going to see in this video. I'm starting the process with ripping some 3 quarter inch form plywood that I have on hand. This is a very nice flat solid plywood product with some kind of a paper face on both sides that stands up to repeated concrete pours really well. I've got to tell you I feel pretty lucky to be able to build these boxes inside a wood shop instead of where concrete forms are usually built which is outside in the dirt. probably seen bridge abutments, you know, fancy pillars and posts and pylons and piers. I wonder why all those things start with the letter P. I don't know, but you know, the bridges that were built in the previous couple of centuries and up through the 1940s had decorative concrete columns at the approach. And they are beautiful with relief, you know, different shapes. And almost all of the corners and many of the relief features are defined by chamfer which is a 45 degree angle across the corners of the concrete. So I'm doing just a little bit of that here. I've got, I ripped on the table saw out of some clear cedar, some big chamfer at the corners, and now I'm gonna put chamfer strip around the top. Doesn't pay to try to make three quarter inch chamfer in my opinion, and it does not pay to try to cut it with a skill saw or a chop saw or a hacksaw, but get a pair of chamfer cutters. You see that? It's kind of like, gardening shears or loppers, except it has calibrations or cut lines incised on the table so you can estimate 45 degree, 22 and a half degree and various other you know intermediate settings with a little stop at the back and you can cut your bevels and that's a lot easier than going back and forth to a saw and trying to make it happen. Now the other thing that's easier that you have probably seen me do or talk about before is scribing rather than measuring and cutting. That's especially true with this. I can put this in place where it goes and get a very representative mark and cut it much faster than I could uh, measure it, get the mark, cut it, and then expect it to fit. Want a 45 degree angle? I slide it back into the throat of this thing and cut it. I'll do it again. A little further from the end because it kind of likes to blow up if you're too close to the end of the piece. And if it pushes itself away, you just keep it parallel to that fence as it goes. Bam. We're going to take this length off of that one, like this, put it back on the table angled the other way. see how we did. A little bit long. Shave it. Now it's not fine woodwork, but it's pretty good form work.
So as it turns out, a chamfer cutter won't make every cut. Now it'll make most of them. It'll make the standard cuts, but coming into that corner from two sides into a big piece of chamfer and then coming across is a crown molding problem. And so I'm not even going to try to tell you what these angles are because it doesn't matter. I've hip shot it. It fits well enough for um, form work and it's gonna look great if I can make the pins go in there without splitting these little short pieces apart. There we go. So this is what it looks like from the bottom, which is the reverse image of what the concrete will look like from the top. Crisco, pretty good form release, fill spaces, fill screw heads. I mean, I could just spray oil on this, but I don't think I'm going to. I'm gonna brush the whole thing down with Crisco, make sure that when it's time to strip these things, they'll strip, and that we don't get any more embedment of this, uh, these little um, wooden pieces, and we absolutely have to. So working alongside this road clearly has had its distractions and it's made the filming difficult, but you get the idea. The process has been to capture the accuracy you can at each step and lay the groundwork for capturing accuracy in the other direction in the next step. In other words, first step, get it level. Second step, come off the level platform to get the dimension relative to the center of the road. Third step, come off of that dimension to get the dimension parallel to the road. And then the last critical dimension is to get the center line of the bolt template exactly where the center line of the post has got to be. Because I'm going to be using the template that I use to make this to drill the steel plate that the post is going to weld to. So it's just a progressive tightening of the tolerance and checking the box one at a time on X, Y, and Z, if that makes any sense. One advantage that I have enjoyed very much is that since I'm going to make the gate, the distance between these piers is entirely negotiable, and it only had to be close. The gate's going to be about 15 feet wide, but I'll verify that once the posts are in. These are 18 inch, three quarter inch diameter J bolts. Nice and strong. And they're gonna hook right around inside that cage, just about right.
So I'm going to sort of throw back the covers on this a little bit. I dug that center ditch wrong. I wish I would have painted it more carefully. I wish I would have had someone watching me dig more carefully. So it doesn't, the grade beam does not come in quite centered on either one of the piers. But I don't think it makes any difference whatsoever. It's still going to tie the two piers together. It's still going to provide resistance to overturning, you know, towards the middle and away from the middle. So I think it is a non-issue. At least I'm going to make that assertion and stick to it. If any of you are engineers and want to weigh in in the comments about what the difference between a footing and a grade beam, the effect that those hoops have inside that rectangular section cage, what it does with the torsional stress and all of those kinds of things, it would be welcome. And in the meantime, day after tomorrow, the mud shows up second round on the trucks. But it's all right. It's only about, I think, five yards. I'm going to have a man you haven't met named Kevin Steele here helping me because I didn't want to bring Dustin in on something as basic as this. It's going to mostly be two different slumps, a little bit of a timing issue, and then uh, vibrate and consolidate and tap the outside of that form like crazy. Well, that's it. These things are ready to fill up with concrete, for better or for worse. And next up in this little series, you're going to get a look at some 3-inch slump mud. And then adding water to raise the slump to about a 6 halfway through the pour. And then finally, after about a week of setup time, you'll get to see whether or not the Crisco actually worked as a form release on the chamfer strip. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work. Wow, cool. So that's the operator that, that goes right the there. That's the operator putting there. Wow, that is so cool. Jeez, that's a ton of electric it's stuff. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Wow. There's going to be a, a security camera up on the top of this one. Yeah. Like we talked. Yeah. There's a couple extra chases in there in case I want, you know, just to Yeah, definitely.